we're all given certain resources and skills, whether it's being healthy enough to help someone or, uh, you know, if we're not healthy enough to do that or don't have the skills, to pray for someone, to, uh, you know, make a cup of coffee for someone, uh, to write a thank you letter, you know, I think life is really just about making the world, uh, making, I was told my daughter Laura, just make the world, not the world, just the community you're in, your school, your block, whatever, just a tiny bit better because you were there. Welcome back to Neighboring. Neighboring is a podcast hosted by NeighborLink Fort Wayne where we attempt to answer the question, what does it mean to be a good neighbor? We invite friends, uh, volunteers of NeighborLink, community members, businesses, and neighbors themselves around the table and simply just have a discussion about what does it mean to be a good neighbor, a person's journey towards um, this kind of lifestyle. And today is an exciting time because we have Mark Schmidt uh, who got involved with NeighborLink a handful of years ago. And he's quickly become a very active volunteer and he brings so much energy and joy and his professionalism to NeighborLink. One of the things we've experienced in really the last seven or eight years is as our population continues to, to age in our communities, people are retiring and they're retiring uh, at all different spectrums. Uh, in a community the size of Fort Wayne, we're seeing many companies uh, have executive level folks choose to leave the, the workplace, meaning those businesses are leaving Fort Wayne, leaving many people deciding, do we pick up our family and our family unit and move along with the job to finish out our last three, four, five, eight years in the professional world before really retiring? Or uh, is this a good time to just stay local and either take some time off start volunteering, pick up a part-time job, but really kind of change the work-life integration and balance. And that's been a bit of Mark's story. Uh, and we've uh, just really enjoyed Mark's presence. And today, we hope to sit down and just have a discussion um, for Mark to share a bit of his story, his professional journey, his uh, family life. For me, as somebody that's in their late 30s with three young kids and uh, trying to balance work, life, vocation, purpose, and all those things. I look to, to Mark really as a mentor, uh, someone that's just kind of worked through some of the balance issues that I think my family has as we try to embrace this. So I'm really excited to get to know a little bit more about your story and share it with the rest because sure. from your perspective or from my perspective, I think you've got a lot to share, um, whether it's how do you find purpose from while you're a working executive professional in a big company? How do you balance that? How do you get your family involved? How do you do the things you enjoy while still caring about the community? And then uh, once you hit a pivot point and a transition point in your life, how do you, what are the options for people? Like, do you just go into retirement and do those things? If you want to get involved in an organization or transition, you, you not only you, but you and the community represent in NeighborLink are wrestling with that very question. So today, I'm hopefully we can have that conversation. Okay. And I know this might be a little uncomfortable for you because you yeah, are yeah. a very humble guy. And, but I hope that, that the story in today's conversation will be a okay. little more comfortable. All right. So Mark, introduce yourself, uh, paint the picture, tell, tell us how, how you got involved with NeighborLink and even more so, I'm really curious as an individual, um, Tell me about your family. Like, where, where did service um, really start happening in your life? Has this always been? Uh, introduce yourself. Okay. Um, my name is Mark Schmidt. Um, I'm 61 years old. Um, I, I've been married to my wife, Jerry, for uh, a long time. 39 years. Yeah. yeah. 39 years. Uh, we started dating when she was 17 and I was 18. So we've been together a long time. Uh, we've got three kids, Brian, Eric, and Laura, 34, 32, and 30. And um, so uh, when I graduated from college, if you want to start there, yeah. uh, I took a job with GE. We moved around for a couple years uh, and uh, ended up in Fort Wayne uh, probably about 30, 30 or 32 years ago. And 
had a variety of jobs. Even though I have an engineering degree, I would not describe myself as an engineer because I never designed any product, but I was a manufacturing engineer, quality engineer, plant manager at the Broadway plant in Fort Wayne. Um, did some project management, uh, helped start up a couple joint ventures, um, uh, some new product introductions. And then when I was 57, uh, the company announced that they were closing uh, operations in Fort Wayne. And uh, because I had 35 years in, I qualified for an early retirement. Very fortunate for that. And uh, so, um, tried to decide what to do, and through all the years, you know, Jerry, my wife, uh, always said that if that ever happens uh, and we have the opportunity, we ought to take advantage of retiring early. So when it happened, you know, I said, well, should I get uh, another job? And she said, no. Okay. <laughs> so she's been very supportive, and I just uh, felt a different calling, and so um, I just, uh, um, I, I wouldn't say I'm retired, um, I just don't get paid. <laughs> I, work, I work for you, boss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. based on the amount of time and energy, and, uh, and more than that, just the time and energy, the, the way you approach volunteers in my neighborhood, I would certainly say that you, you, don't, yeah. uh, you haven't stopped working yet. You know, yeah. I'm just working for a different, different cause and venture, mm -hmm. and for a different reason. Yep. So tell me about um, you know, faith, religion, and spirituality, and living this out is very important for you. Did, did that play a part, or like go back to when, when did you really kind of start like volunteering? Have you, have you always since a young age in terms of like volunteering service, when did that aspect kind of really come in, come into your life? Okay, well, you tipped me off on some of the questions. You're going out of sequence here, Andrew, oh, but yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, uh, well, I guess the first thing you have to recognize is I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, um, and I just feel called. And through all the years uh, when I was working, and you wanted to talk about work-life balance and everything, yeah. I'm a very bad example, okay? I suppose if you called me a workaholic, that would probably be a fair description. And, uh, you know, through all the years when I was working, I put in a lot of hours. Um, and uh, and I struggled with, should I be doing more volunteer work, things like that. But it was hard for me uh, to make time. And, uh, and I just concluded eventually that um, my time should be spent serving the people at work. Mm. I mean, I always had a lot of positions where I was responsible for things, whether or not we were successful, um, kind of hinged on whether or not we had jobs in Fort Wayne. Yeah. And, um, and we really truly were in it for the people in our organization. But I always felt bad about not doing anything beyond that, but I figured that my calling was to make life better for people on my team. I hope, I hope they feel that way. Um, because your relationship with your manager and your relationships at work, uh, they pass on to your family and life at home and everything else. So yeah. I felt that was my calling. So the only volunteering, well, I guess I did several things, but my main volunteering probably during my working years was coaching soccer because it's something I could do with my family. So I coached soccer for many years and um, with Brian and then with Eric. And um, so I really didn't do a whole lot of volunteering other than that until I retired. When you wrestle with that work, so let's go back a little bit and talk about like the importance of work in your life and then you know how you wrestle with that work-life balance because I think that's, um, that's very real in terms of like what, what we're all facing with within that work-life balance and prioritization and values and all those things. Like works works important to us it's part of our identity we put a lot of time mm -hmm. into that mm -hmm. tell us uh, tell me more a little bit more on like what did that work-life balance mean to you or like did it go in waves where you felt like you were on, more on top of it than others um certainly through my career there was a lot of times that were very stressful and i wondered if i was doing a good job or should be doing something else uh, my wife will tell you that we had a lot of walks through the neighborhood and she's been a great listener yeah I'm, super fortunate to have her. Um, but at one point I concluded that work is not a four letter word. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad thing. You know, God created us to do things, to be members of the community. 
Um, and one of the things we do is we work and we make a living and we pay taxes and we design and create products that are used by people and work is not a bad thing. Yeah. And, um, uh, and, and so tried to create a work-life balance, but really my hours were spent either doing that or with my family. Uh, and also, uh, certainly, uh, I've been heavily influenced by church. You know, I'm very, very fortunate to uh, have always been uh, at St. Vincent's, um, okay. you know, which is a great place. You've been there for the entire time? We've been there the entire time. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, so really, the volunteering significantly didn't start until I retired. Okay. And, um, so it might not be the answer you're looking for, but it's no. the way my life is. Yeah. I mean, we're called to do what we do well. And hopefully my kids have grown up as mm -hmm. responsible adults, and I think they have. I'm very sure. proud of them. That's great. You mentioned that there was some point during that, that work time where you recognized, like, hey, work isn't just a place to work, but it's a place where if I'm not, that I can, the, that the responsibility, at least for you at the time, you had this point where you said service is a place for, or work is this place where I get to serve my employees. Mm -hmm. What, how long had you been working before you kind of came to that? Because you, you worked at GE for over 30 years. Yeah. Was, is in the first handful of years or were, were you in like 10 or 15 years? Like yeah, what kind prob of probably more like 10 or 15 mm -hmm. years. Because I think when you're young, you're trying to figure out what should I be doing for a living and you know, you have a lot of worries about paying the bills and, uh, you know, what my, what's my career going to do? And at some point, you just start getting comfortable and you kind of gravitate towards what you're good at. Mm -hmm. Eventually, it led me to project management, which is probably the thing that I was better at than some of the other things. And then you get comfortable and, you know, you figure that, well, maybe this is what I was made for right now. Yeah. Um, you know, I will say that, you know, through the years, a lot of times I was in positions where, I felt like, uh, man, I am not qualified for this. And uh, I remember I had a boss one time, Dick Krause, who said, um, you know, when I get in those stressful situations, I say, you know, Lord, I can't do this. I can't do this without you. And so, um, you know, kind of my motto became, do what's right, do your best, treat others you like to be treated, and then just leave the results in God's hands. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's always given me calm and getting me through things, you know, being able to trust and leave things in his hand, whatever may happen. I, I imagine that, uh, did, you notice, did you notice a big difference within a couple of years of when you kind of made that mental switch in terms of, you know, working, trying to figure out but when you hit some stability and or some comfort level and made this switch to where you kind of reframed your thinking in terms of how do I serve my team? Did you were there were there things that really kind of started to change in the culture or within the teams you were working with, like in terms of productivity or relationships with your coworkers? Or, um, well, I think that the things that at some point in time you have to figure out what works for you. Mm -hmm. You know, you might be a traditional type leader, different leadership styles work for different people. And, um, and so I think you mature and you figure out what works best for you. And just like with the Carpenter Sons, you know, our, 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 our group that uh, we volunteer with now, um, I think there's a lot of things that make it work. Um, and, you know, part of those is just trusting the guys on your team letting go, um, you know, realizing that it's not about you. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I don't know if that's a very good answer or not. But. No, it's, it's a good answer. Uh, one of the things that, that, you know, for me at NeighborLink, um, you know, I took this job 11 years ago and spent the first six years by myself. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, which is a whole different environment when you're the only employee in an organization that you feel passionate about. Like 100% of the things are your responsibility. And so you just learn how to uh, operate very independently and be a self-starter and, and be really obedient and responsible to the things that have to get done. And while, yes, we're a volunteer organization, my job has always been to try to serve our volunteers and make sure they're equipped to do what they need to do. But operationally, it was all kind of falling on me. And so you learn how to kind of live in that environment and you kind of create your own your own space and how you work in that. But 
over the last couple of years and especially the last kind of 18 months as we've gone from one employee to four then to nine employees adding six new staff people at NeighborLink uh, seeing the change from like mm-hmm. here I am working in this very like independent environment kind of on my own to now I've got a couple of key coworkers that are really like they had come from relationships and now they're working with us and so it's very still organic in me in my own space but now we have nine employees mm-hmm. and now I've got a team and you know the differences between leadership and management and adjustments uh, are very real kind of in my journey of the last you know 12 months or so so it's been interesting for me to just change my framework and my understanding of my roles and my responsibilities and like what does it mean to support and support our team here more so than just kind of staying in my own bubble and doing my own thing so mm-hmm. it does make sense mm-hmm. one of the things we've kind of talked around this idea there's a lot of conversation in the world about like this work-life balance and so far i'm not sure that i fully understand or believe that a work-life balance is like actual an actual thing or attainable mm-hmm way that I've been trying to re- reframe that since kind of day one is like, what does work-life integration look like mm-hmm. in terms of how does work-life, purpose, vocation, how do those, how do we integrate those? Because especially in today's day and age, you know, we're sent home with laptops, we're sent home with cell phones, you know, to an extent our workplaces expect us to be on mm-hmm. any and all times. And I think healthier workplaces are also now starting to understand that like life needs to press into work too. Like mm-hmm. you can't expect your staff to be on call 20 hours a day without them also being on call to life in that. Mm-hmm. While certain environments can make that easier than others, the ideas of work-life integration and then incorporating purpose. How does how has that resonated with you and as you wrestled with work-life balance for 30 years and now finding some time Mm-hmm. Uh, post you know career phase w- w- curious what you think about that idea of work-life integration versus work-life balance yeah um, yeah I think one of the important things is um, and the world has changed by the way yeah. because we're all connected and we never get away from work and our cell phones and our laptops and everything else but one of the things I try to do, and the guys will say I'm terrible at this, is I try not to bother people on Sundays. Yeah, I know I'm lying. <laughs> I try not to bother people on Sundays or evenings and things like that. Uh, uh, but the thing is, the stuff that we do today, you know, in our volunteer group, you know, Carpenter Sons, I don't think any of us view it as work. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just, you know, tons of fun. Um, you know, just guys hanging out together. Um, so it, it's more difficult today in your career than it was for me in mine. Um, yeah. Was there any time during your uh, 30 plus year career where you felt like you were on the wrong like career ladder? Yeah, like <laughs> quite where, often. Like where you were <laughs> really wrestling with this idea like, I'm not sure that I'm wired up for this or I'm not sure I wanna keep doing this, there's something else out there or like I'm being pulled, what do I do about that? Oh, yeah, very much so. Um, you know, I always, uh, and by the way, this is not how I thought this whole conversation was going to go, but, uh, you know, because it's getting a little bit close and personal, but, uh, you know, I always wanted to be someone with a skill. I always admired the engineers who, you know, went about designing the products and were experts at something. I always wanted to be an expert at something, you know, and I never really was, and what happened in my career is, um, you know, and in 35 years, I don't think I ever applied for a job. You know, they said, oh, we need for you to do this, and we need for you to do that, and need for you to do that. And I always felt like I was uh, kind of promoted onto the level of incompetence or whatever, the <laughs> Peter Principle or whatever. Uh, I always got really good performance appraisals and everything else, so hopefully that wasn't the case. Yeah, sure. But a lot of times, you know, I wondered, and, you know, I, uh, and I really think that, um, the periods where it helped me was when my faith grew stronger, um, when I started to believe and started to trust and started to surrender, um, you know, always, you know, doing what's right, doing my best, 
yeah. actually doing my reasonable best because I'm kind of a perfectionist. So we've, ch <laughs> we've changed that in our families, do your reasonable best. Uh, but I always wondered, man, Lord, why are you giving me these positions? I don't want to do this, but it just happened. And I think uh, one of the guys the other day was saying, you know, God opens doors for us. And uh, sometimes we have to go beyond our comfort zone and walk through them, and there's got to be a reason. And I really think, you know, I'm kind of quiet, and uh, uh, I don't think I'd be able to do and serve the way I do today if I hadn't gone through all the things at work. So maybe there was some plan. Yeah. I don't know, but it, it turned out good. Turned out all right. Yeah, it did. Yeah, I, I was, I graduated college. I uh, knew I wanted to do advertising, so I pursued a career in advertising, worked for a couple of ad agencies, and, and really loved it. And, you know, I'm only a handful of years out of college, and it's just a whole transitional period in terms of trying to figure that out, trying to work, trying to figure out who and how I'm wired professionally, and really enjoyed that. But the more that I got involved volunteering, the more that I started recognizing, like, is this the right ladder? Mm -hmm. um, I was. I feel fortunate because I can reflect on it now. But I really feel fortunate in my mid twenties to be able to be in a position to not only necessarily hear that in terms of is this the path that you want to go professionally, uh, meaning am I on the right career ladder? Everyone's saying go that way, or you know that has been the narrative that I'd heard: get to college, go to work, you can achieve anything you you want, make as much money as you want, those types of things. You just work hard at it. Mm -hmm. and stay committed to it and so I did that but I started really questioning is that the right ladder for for me to go on and wondering what the other ladder was uh, due to relationships and some people in my life and me pursuing some things on my own I, and then volunteering really mm -hmm. started in like I think that there's a whole different ladder but I'm not sure what that next ladder is mm -hmm. uh, all I know is I'm not sure that this is the right ladder to keep climbing so there was a period in my time where, in my life during that time, where it was a matter of like, how do I come off the ladder, back to the ground, and find some comfort in not knowing what was next, but giving space to it. Mm -hmm. And so while I was trying to leave advertising, myself and another person in our agency got let go or downsized, and that kind of launched me into this period of time where I was like, oh, that's kind of weird getting let go, but I've been looking to leave. So I took some time off and was able to volunteer and explore and really detox in a way in order to find the right ladder and that's worked for me in the in the last 10 years people hear a little bit of that story and they come and I, it's people in their 30s 40s 50s coming and hearing a little bit of that story and saying I think I'm on the wrong ladder there's something more in life um, how did you go about that transition and uh, the same kind of advice is like it's really challenging the older you get like I couldn't imagine doing that now with kids and mm -hmm. those types of things but uh, I'm always interested in hearing other other professionals or like what's the rhythm. I think it happens more often than people give it credit or at least we talk about it saying, you know what, maybe you have to stay on this ladder because of your life circumstances, but how do you begin exploring some of those other things with your extra time in order to maybe see if you're on the right ladder or not, or mm -hmm. you're still on the right ladder, but maybe you need to reorient the way you're working or interacting with people in order to get that intrinsic value out of. Yeah, you know, and, and I wonder if sometimes people spend too much time trying to figure it out and maybe they'd be better off just doing a good job of what they're doing and then those opportunities present themselves. Yeah. And sometimes the opportunities present themselves from doing things outside of work, volunteering, you know, you meet people, you make connections. You know, just like in our volunteer world today, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our group, yeah. the Carpenter Sons. Yeah. Um, you know, when I retired, uh, uh, it's like, man, what am I going to do with myself? And uh, uh, I met Jeff Schatz. Someone went on a grade 80 bike ride, heard about this group called NeighborLink, said you might be interested. I made the mistake of going to the website and <laughs> filling out a, a thing saying I'd like to volunteer. And I got a call from Jeff Chateau about an hour later. We met for coffee. I had just joined the St. Vincent de Paul Society. I went to a meeting and uh, Franco Du, the president, had been looking for something more to do because we do food deliveries, pay utility bills, operate the caravan, take people medical appointments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they was looking for something more. So we talked about NeighborLink and boom, we had eight guys like two days later. And that's how we started. We've been doing it ever since. But 
The point I wanted to make is that people trying to figure out what they should be doing, there's a lot of guys, we have different paths. One guy was a music teacher, one guy was an IRS auditor, one guy was a UPS driver, a bunch of engineers, some salesmen, et cetera. And I think certainly for myself, and I know for a lot of the guys, uh, you're doing things different than what you would normally do. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like, I, I really, I like this, I'm good at this. I never had the opportunity because I yeah. went down a career that was mm -hmm. different. And uh, I would never describe myself, for example, as handy on a scale of one to 10. I always said I'm about a four. Well, now I'm about a six because I've learned so much and I yeah. like it. So um, you just have to be willing to, like I mentioned earlier, go outside your comfort zone and uh, try some different things and who knows what doors get open for you. Yeah. Well, you certainly didn't uh, wait around for retirement to, uh, you know, really set in. You kind of hop right into to NeighborLink and, and plenty of other volunteer opportunities that you're involved in as well. And I think that's been uh, really great to see. Has that been important? Like, how do you see um, making that kind of leap immediately? Did it feel like you you kind of missed a beat? Did you take some time off before you really kind of like, you know, did you create a gap between work and when you really dove into volunteerism or has that just been a really kind of seamless process? Uh, pretty seamless. I'm yeah. probably atypical. Um, facetiously, when I was getting ready to retire, I told people I'm not sure what I'm gonna do, but I wanna volunteer 50 hours a week. Facetiously, yeah. simply <laughs> meaning that yeah. I, I'm too young to be retired, retired. And uh, the name of the thing came, thing came up just like that, and mm -hmm. also some things at Turnstone. So it was intentional that I wanted to keep busy, and so didn't take any time off, uh, which is good. Didn't feel like I needed it. Um, and, uh, um, you know, uh, I, I think I've heard people say, Someone gave me some really good advice, said, don't jump into anything when you retire. I think that's bad advice. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I don't think there's anything wrong with going from work straight to doing something, especially if you find something that you love. Yeah. And uh, for me, like I said, maybe that's not typical, but going straight from, you know, a working career to volunteering has been a good thing. And you, you, so you retire, you get involved with NeighborLink, and you start connecting some dots between church and um, your own personal service and some of your community, and then connected some dots within NeighborLink because there had been a number of other kind of uh, groups made up of primarily retirees or underemployed in between jobs mm -hmm. at NeighborLink. And so you started connecting some dots and then created what you call the Carpenter Sons, or at least uh, help coordinate mm -hmm. the Carpenter Sons yeah. rather than just being I'm not the, the leader. Mayor. I'm the yeah. dispatcher. You're yep. the dispatcher. Yep. So yep. describe um, to the audience, talk about the Carpenter Sons, kind of give them a, a framework of what that is, some of the things you guys do um, or like to do, and then we'll sure. probably dive into some of the culture that's happening in and around and because of it. I'll be happy to. It's my favorite subject. Um, so the Carpenter Stones uh, started by the St. Vincent de Paul Society and it's organized by us, the St. Vincent de Paul Society, but very much open to people of all faiths. And uh, you know, most of the guys are from St. Vincent's, but we've got guys from Anchor Community Church, City Church, Pathway, Holy Cross, Precious Blood, St. Joe Brooklyn. I hope I'm not missing anyone. If I did, I apologize, but um, it's a diverse group of folks. Right? It's a diverse yeah. group of folks, various backgrounds. Uh, we get together every Tuesday. We do projects. There's usually about 20 of us every Tuesday, and then numerous of us who work all during the week. And um, uh, it really, you know, you hear people say, "Oh, you get more out of it than you put into mm -hmm. it." Um, you know, I I think it's fair to say that. Probably all of us, our best friends are just each other. We have a strong sense of camaraderie or brotherhood or fellowship or whatever you want to call it. And uh, uh, we all just feel called. And uh, we have available time and we're still young enough and healthy enough to do things. And uh, yeah, so it's been really good. We always say we have, uh, we might go to different churches, but we have one boss and it's not you. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. 
Oh, talk to us about some of the types of projects that you guys kind of take on. Okay. Because each uh, one of these groups really becomes and forms its own identity based on the people that are in the group. Yeah. So every kind of subgroup, whether it's a church, a business, or another retiree group, or they all kind of build their own kind of culture and the things that they're interested in. For yeah. you guys, what do you guys really sure. want to focus on? Sure. Uh, you know, and on the neighborhood, and by the way, NeighborLink is the master connector and enabler. Um, you know, when we started up, uh, we had guys who wanted to help but didn't know who to help. And uh, NeighborLink provided that with the database. And now about half of, well, more than half of our projects just come word of mouth and then the other half or so from the NeighborLink website. Um, but an organization would have a very, very difficult time starting up without NeighborLink, the NeighborLink website. And of course, you gave us Jeff Chateau, who is the most wonderful man in the world, yeah. to help coordinate our volunteer activities. But uh, and all the tools, uh, we have a workshop provided by Three Rivers Wesleyan Church at no cost to us. They're wonderful. But the kind of things we do is we do minor home repair projects. Um, we uh, uh, we don't do electrical. We don't want to burn a house down. We don't do serious plumbing, but we'll replace faucets. Uh, we'll fix leaks. We'll change ceiling fans, things like that. Uh, we build a lot of stairs, handrails. Uh, we build a lot of wheelchair ramps. We built 65 of them last year. Um, we uh, fix disposers. We fix garage door openers. Uh, we repair gutters. Uh, uh, so, but there's things we don't do. We don't do yard work. We don't do roofs. Sorry, Ron. Actually, we do a few, but not <laughs> officially. Um, we don't do painting projects because uh, we try and make the biggest impact in the community. And if a lot of the guys have skills, which they do, uh, they should be working on those things that, you know, family members probably cannot do. Yeah. And, and really, it doesn't matter how many skills you got. You know, someone said, oh, someone's probably intimidated about joining the group because they don't think they're very handy. Well, as long as you can screw in a deck board you know, you can join the group. Sure. And uh, we try and find projects that people like to do. And in fact, there are some guys that like painting, so we'll occasionally yeah. do a painting project. I'm just always so, so impressed um, by the quantity of work and the quality of work that you guys do all on your own. Sure, we are providing some network and some support structure. Like, we really feel like our job is to just really resource and empower and kind of eliminate the barriers. But the type of volume, it gives us so much hope in our community when uh, a group of 20 or 30 people can have such an impact in terms of meeting the number of needs and the type of needs uh, based on how many projects that are really really going unmet in our community. So uh, it's, it's phenomenal. What have been some of the other cultural impacts uh, around the community? You, you mentioned that like here's a group of strangers that have kind of built this community and friendship and using service as a uniter and mm -hmm. some common themes yeah. and beliefs and understandings, mm -hmm. but it's a very diverse group. Uh, what have been some of the other cultural impacts? And, and then you're saying from that being that to now, like there's close friendships made, right? Oh yeah, very close friendships. Yeah. Um, well, some other things is, uh, okay. Um, I uh, grew up and live in a suburban neighborhood never got around town much. And one of the beautiful things is I meet people of all different cultures and backgrounds and, uh, you know, that changes your perspective about the world and uh, makes you grateful for what you have, uh, makes you grateful for, me and for meeting all the people you do. And in fact, I have some good friends who I met through NeighborLink where we've done work at their house. And I consider them close friends now. Uh, you know, people that I probably wouldn't have met otherwise. And, uh, you know, so I think it just kind of opens your eyes and um, you realize that, you know, we might be in different circumstances, but we were all created, you know, for a reason. And, uh, yeah. If you can think back to when you first got started in NeighborLink doing these types of projects to today, what do you feel like what do you feel like you've learned or how do you approach projects differently mm -hmm. uh, so much of service especially faith-based volunteerism has been in this realm of we're here to be a blessing and to give 
out mm -hmm. of out of the the grace and the goodness that we've received free so freely yeah. and while yeah. that is still very true and, and core to the process have you has your approach to meeting some of these needs and or working with uh, vulnerable homeowners changed since from day one to today uh, there's a lot of interesting things in that regard um, uh, you know if you go into it thinking that you know, you're going to find uh, someone who looks like Mother Teresa and a whole bunch of projects like that. You're probably going to be mistaken uh, because we find a lot of wonderful people. We also run into many situations where there was someone sitting on the couch and saying, why can't he or she take care of that? And sometimes she might feel taken advantage of. But the majority of the times, homeowner is extremely uh, uh, appreciative. Um, and, and I think that if you go into it expecting your experience to be positive, you're going to become disillusioned. And uh, nobody's perfect, and we certainly are very far from perfect. Yeah. And, um, and so you just you can't go into it expecting too much. If you're doing it to get hugs, you're doing it for the wrong reason. You know, I think it's really important to do it just to keep it simple, we're just here to serve and won't always be a perfect experience, but so many more good things than bad things come out of it. Uh, you know, and, and then also in that regard of, you know, the volunteering homeowner relationships and so forth and how it's changed, um, I think I've gotten a lot better at realizing that it's important for the volunteer and the homeowner to both have stake in what's going on. Yeah. You know, like I'll go talk to a homeowner and I'll say, hey, you know, we're volunteers with NeighborLink, and, um, uh, you know, the way we work is, you know, we want to donate our time uh, and, and energy at no cost to you for free, but we expect you, the homeowner, to pay for material. You wouldn't expect us, the volunteer, to pay for, the you know, your material. Mm -hmm. And almost always that goes well. You know, you get a little bit better at tactfully handling those conversations. Certainly there's sometimes you run into a very sad situation where you know the homeowner has no other alternative. And I know the guys a lot of times, you know, just, they just take care of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but so I think I've gotten better at handling the difficult conversations because they're not always easy. Yeah. And, uh, and then when I'm not sure what to do, Jeff says, well, Andrew Hoffman always says, err on the side of grace. Yeah. So sometimes we have to err on the side of grace. Yeah. And then one last thing, I know it's a long answer, is uh, Jeff told me one time, hey, if you go, Someone request, posts a request on the website, you go to their house thinking, man, this house is more beautiful than mine. Why, why are we doing this here? Jeff says, well, if you serve them once, shame on them. If you go back a second time, shame on you. <laughs> so we get to self-select our yeah. projects. And, uh, you know, and even if on the surface it looks like, why are we helping this person or that person? Mm -hmm. You never know every, anyone's circumstances. Yeah. You know, you can't judge based on appearances. And, the mission statement is practical neighbor and neighbor expressions of God's love. So I hope it don't sound judgmental. Well, certainly, I hope that's not the case. Uh, well, uh, no, and I think that's uh, the lessons we've been learning in the 15 years we've been doing NeighborLink is that if relationships, if relationships are at the core of our work and the core of the gospel, then spending more time trying to identify the resources through relational engagement versus just looking at every project as a transaction mm -hmm. uh, requires some more work and questions. And if we're in this for relationships, our desire is to help our neighbor, not just a client or a recipient, but they're our neighbor made in God's image and out of and deserve respect and dignity just like we would want them to give to us. Mm -hmm. And so we've been reframing our language for the last 10 years around that idea that this is neighbor to neighbor, that we are neighbors trying to enter into a relationship and that we want to take more time to get to know you, especially when we have identified resources or we bump into those things that have us questioning. Mm -hmm those are good cues in a volunteer and one of the things we've learned and I was just talking about this earlier today in terms of I think for a long time and especially in church-based volunteers we've not been given permission in service to engage relationally to better to be better equipped to evaluate the right solution 
Mm-hmm. We've often been asked to simply show up, give out of God's goodness, whatever they're asking for, mm-hmm. and then walk away. Mm-hmm. Well, those transactions, especially in neighborlings context, is it, 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 it bumps us up um, to those that may be vulnerable in a very direct, personal way. It's one thing to, to hand out food at a food bank, and it's a whole other thing to show up, to be invited to somebody's home and mow their grass or build them a wheelchair ramp. Mm-hmm. And then especially when there's resources on the table, and we have to solve that problem if they're not able to solve it. So why not ask whether they have resources? And not mm-hmm. just from a practical or logistical perspective, but also from, it is hard to ask for help in our culture. It no is. matter no matter your social economic background, yeah. some people have had to ask for more help than others. But asking for help is still hard, yeah. especially in a personal at your home, your greatest asset, and um, you want to you don't want to have those needs. That's why you've mm-hmm. called and asked for help. And so there's dignity and a desire to participate, not just take a handout. Is one of the biggest things that I've learned when as the more that I've got, gained confidence in asking about available resources or moving past. You're exactly right. And, and somebody told me the other day that um, you don't realize how difficult it might be for someone to invite you into their house, a total stranger. And uh, so we always have to keep that in mind. And, you know, wherever you're working, I mean, if my next door neighbor asked me to help him fix something, I would do it. So if it's a neighbor that I haven't met before, that's okay. You know, we'll do it. But, um, yeah, it's, you know, we had a gal, and we do a lot of work for widows, for example. Yeah. And um, um, there was a gal, and, you know, she's just proud all her life. She's never had to ask for help, and how difficult that is for her. And so one of the things we try to do, and obviously, you know, we've learned a lot from you, um, is uh, we have a lot of, having a repeat call is better than, a fresh call because then you establish a relationship and we try to send the same guy or same group of guys and by the way we also have gal volunteers too but we try to send the same guy back to the to the homeowner and establish relationship again and again because that's really that's really what it's all about yeah we often talk about both in our staff and and with our more long-term volunteers we often say that we feel like we've learned more We've been transformed by this process far more than we feel like we've transformed anything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, curious for you in the last couple of years you've been doing this, what, what do you feel like you're learning about yourself when it comes to this type of, this type of work? Uh, well, one is how imperfect I am. Yeah. And uh, uh, built a ramp the other day and invited the homeowner out onto the deck and it's like, Oops, forgot to raise the deck. There was a six inch drop. She couldn't get out of the house. And the guys were really, really great about going back the next day and disassembling it and rebuilding it. So I've learned that, uh, you know, I'm not perfect. Um, yeah, of course, I've always known that. But, um, you know, we make mistakes, but everybody is very, very accepting. Um, and, uh, and also, I've learned that. Everyone has a different level of what's acceptable. Sometimes I'm too picky, you know, and I want things to look too pretty and everything, so I probably drive the guys crazy. <laughs> sure. Um, but, uh, you know, just accepting, uh, you know, letting people do things and everyone doing something a little bit different. And, you know, there's a, there is a lot of value in having two eyes looking at a project because they come up with different solutions, usually something better. So probably a lot of cliches, but, um, yeah. No, that's good. Um, if you could, if say somebody's listening to this and they find themselves kind of inching towards a similar position career-wise or a transition in your life, um, man, uh, woman, whoever, what, how could people get involved with Carpenter Sons or NeighborLink or what general encouragement would you give them um, as some potential next steps for this career change or entering into that. Besides, well, besides taking the, not taking the advice of not over committing <laughs> right at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, the mechanics of it is just to call NeighborLink and then NeighborLink will hook you up. Just like 
when I first retired, I called NeighborLink, and you guys hooked me up with the Grub and Go guys at Fellowship Missionary mm -hmm. Church, Steve Binkley, Bill Pershing, those guys. And then we saw what they were doing and said, hey, you know, we could do this out at St. Vincent's as well. And whether uh, so, it's NeighborLink or Turnstone or any oh, yeah, other organization, or any other. just oh, yeah. follow up, right? Oh, and Turnstone has been fabulous. I mean, we have a very strong relationship with Turnstone, with Vincent Village, uh, other places. So I guess uh, the advice I would give to someone, you know, contemplating retiring and doing some services, uh, don't wait. You know, just go for it. You know, step through the door, get out of your comfort zone, take a risk. Uh, because the people you meet are going to be really, really nice. Mm. And if you don't like it, they can't cut your pay, <laughs> you know? And so it's, uh, yeah, just uh, we were created not to sit in front of the television set. Yeah. Yeah. To wrap this up um, and kind of move on to the, to the end of this episode, curious from your perspective, what do you, what do you believe, what does it mean to be a good neighbor? Um, I knew you were going to ask this question, uh, mm -hmm. but um, I really think just uh, sharing the resources. You know, we were all given certain resources and skills, whether it's being healthy enough to help someone or, uh, you know, if we're not healthy enough to do that or don't have the skills, to pray for someone, to, uh, you know, make a cup of coffee for someone, uh, to write a thank you letter. You know, I think life is really just about making the world, I, making, I was told my daughter, Laura, just make the world, not the world, just the community you're in, your school, your block, whatever, just a tiny bit better because you were there. You know, be a net giver yeah. in life. Yeah. And so just use whatever skills mm -hmm. you've been given to do good. Well, Mark, I'm grateful that you chose to... Uh, come to our bike event and <laughs> then uh, call Jeff Chateau and, and be, be lured by his uh, customer service and uh, easy pathways and then all you've done. And on behalf of all of Carpenter's Sons and all the other folks that you make welcome uh, in order to make that community work. I know it is a community, it's not just all, all you. Um, mm -hmm. This has been a great conversation. Thanks for sharing uh, some of your personal journey. Uh, it really does impact uh, me and how I think. and learning as a younger leader what um, I'm learning from from all of our volunteers including you guys and uh, so excited to be able to go and try to try to acquire additional resources and then keep eliminating those barriers and I'm so grateful that we have so many stories to tell the community about the not just the work and the practical things that we get done but the relationships that are getting formed between our volunteers and the people they're serving as well as our volunteers for them together. So this is really great. Thanks for everyone that is tuning into these neighboring podcasts. We'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, subscribe, leave a comment, uh, send us an email. If you have different individuals or topics that you would like us to address in this podcast and give us some feedback as we continue to make this podcast better. And until then, go and uh, be kind to a neighbor lean into that urging that you sense as you walk your neighborhoods or walk around your workplace and do the things that nobody's asking you to do. Thanks, Mark, for being right. on this episode. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. Thanks.